so we had some difficulties with that, so let's uh, summarize what we uh, went through here. How many arrows are there in an E2 reaction? We've seen that in an E2 reaction, there's three arrows. Here's the three arrows, an arrow for the leaving group leaving, an arrow for the pi bond forming, and an arrow for the base taking the beta hydrogen. And how many arrows are there in an E1? Well, there's three arrows again, it's just that they're split up into two separate steps. In the first step, you only have one of the arrows. That was this step here. Here was our first step where we just have the leaving group leaving. And then how many arrows does that leave for the second step? Well, that leaves two arrows left over for the second step. The pi bond forming and the base taking the beta hydrogen. So those are the two arrows that we put in uh, over here. So we're going to have the same three arrows for both E1 and E2. It's just that in E2, you draw them all in a single step. Whereas in E1, you do the leaving group leaving arrow first, and then you do the two remaining arrows in the second step. All right, um, and that gave us this. Uh, and um, if there's more than one beta carbon, um, notice that oftentimes, even if there's more than one beta carbon, the beta carbons are basically symmetrical or equivalent. Okay. In that case, you can just pick whichever one is convenient. What do you do when the beta carbons are not equivalent? Well, we won't get into that today. Okay. okay. All right, now let's see if we can draw the intermediates from this step. Okay. Now that we have these arrows, we should be able to draw the intermediate or the product that we'll get from that step. When you're ready. Looks like you got that, but for practice, let's use the atom by atom technique. Okay. Who's the number one attached to? Um, the number three. And who's the three attached to? Now, a better answer would have been, it's got a sigma bond to the number four, oh. and a sigma and a pi bond to the number two. We want to know exactly how they're attached. But you drew that correctly, so obviously you're seeing that. Good. Um, and then, um, is, uh, is, and there's nobody else that's interesting that's attached. We know the hydrogen's not attached to the number two anymore, so who is it attached to? The, it's a hydronium now. It's attached to the water. Good. And let's be specific about exactly which atom it's attached to. Uh, uh, to the neutral oxygen. That's right. Although you're right, usually it's just drawn like this, but it's on the oxygen. And then we have to take care of the charges. Well, the oxygen is at the initial tail, so it ends up with a positive charge, so it's good that you saw that we put this in. And it's good that you know the name for this is hydronium. This is hydronium, uh, protonated water. And the final head was the number three. That started positive and it's gaining electrons. This is very good. Uh, uh, one issue here, though, is um, what would be, oh, so this is the number three carbon. What is the molecular geometry of this number three carbon here? What's the name for this geometry? Linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral? It's um, trigonal planar. Trigonal planar, that's right, because it's got a double bond. Uh, do you remember what the bond angle is when you're trigonal planar? Um, 109? That would be tetrahedral. Oh, so um, would be 120. Yeah. And you can kind of see that because if you're trigonal planar, you basically look like this. And you, you're basically splitting up the circle into three regions. Well, 360 divided by 3 is 120. Anyway, the upshot is the bond angle is not 90 degrees. So we would not want to draw a double bond like this. Instead, we want to draw the double bond like this. You'd like, you want to show that there's actually a 120 degree bond angle between the number one and the number four over here. I can see how you would end up with this because that's how this original picture was drawn over here. Uh, but it's a little bit better to show this geometry a little bit more accurately here. So when we have a double bond, we should draw the double bond like this. Or if you wanted to, like this. doesn't matter whether it's horizontal or vertical, but the key thing is there should be 120 degree bond angles. Okay. Uh, geometry can be important, so that's a good thing to, to see. So we'll end up with these here as our products.
you got these correct, you were not 100% confident, and again, one way to be a little more confident is just to go atom by atom and ask, who, does the arrow, who do the arrows tell me is connected to whom? The arrows don't lie. So if we just take our time, it doesn't matter how unfamiliar the product is, we should always be able to get that right. Uh, what happened to this iodide? Well, it's just what goes floating off. The iodide's not interesting to us anymore here. It's just the leaving group. Okay, so that was our E1 reaction. I said E2 is the most complicated reaction, but maybe E1 is the most complicated because we have to split it up into two groups. So it helps, maybe it'll help to actually have these written in words. You can just follow along in words here for what E1 and E2 is. Uh, first, we had the leaving group leaving. That was the same step for SN1 and for E1. The only difference then is that if this was an SN1, the water attacks as a nucleophile. But if it's E1, the water attacks as a base. This is an excellent example of the difference between a nucleophile and a base. A nucleophile joins the alpha carbon, whereas a base steals the beta hydrogen. Um, so that was a, a good example of uh, that happening here. Now, how would you know when to just draw the SN1 product and when you should draw both the SN1 and this minor E1 product? Well, you kind of got to see what your instructor likes. Um, you got to see what his answer keys look like to see. Um, if he says draw all possible products, he probably wants both SN1 and E1. Uh, if he says draw the major product, maybe he only wants SN1. Uh, and of course, if he says draw the substitution product, you should just do the SN1. Okay. And if he says draw the elimination product, you should do the E1. So you have to pay close attention to what the problem is saying, because anytime the table says SN1 slash E1, you will get a mix of both of them, 95% SN1 and approximately 5% uh, E1. Uh, then you have five more minutes, maybe we'll do one more E1 to, to nail that down. Okay, so. Or no, I will tell you what we're going to do, you will figure it out. Who knows what the next mechanism will be? Let's see. All right, so uh, let's see here. Let's try drawing. Uh, so let's try drawing all possible products. Okay. All possible products. Thank you. 